here's an awesome integral from the Putnam exam. And I think it was the 2005 exam. Yeah, anyway. So I'm going to approach this integral using three different techniques. The first one involves a simple trig substitution of letting x equal the tangent of phi. And from there, we can evaluate the resulting integral using the, te using the uh, properties of the definite integral. And the second technique I will be uh, using is the Weierstrass substitution of letting x equal 1 minus phi divided by 1 plus phi, which is absolutely awesome, as you will see in a short while. And the third technique is my favorite. It's Feynman's trick. And I would love to hear your take by the end of the video on which approach is the coolest. Now, for this video, I will not be discussing this substitution and properties of the definite integral approach in detail because I have evaluated the integral resulting from the substitution in detail uh, in a previous video and I've provided the link to that video in the description. So I'm going to be discussing this only partially. However, it will convey the message and if you want to check out the complete video, uh, you have the link in the description. Anyway, so let i be this integral and using the substitution we have, oh my, oh, we have to let x equal the tangent of phi, which implies that dx equals the square of the secant of phi, uh, d phi. And this further implies that dx divided by the square of the secant, which is in fact 1 plus the square of the tangent of phi, and the square of the tangent of phi, according to our substitution, is just x squared. So that means we have dx by 1 plus x squared equal to d phi. Okay, cool. So how does our integral transform? And oh, yes, the limits. Now, as x approaches 0, uh, for x to approach 0, you want phi to approach 0 as well. And for x to approach 1, we need phi to approach uh, pi by 4, correct? So this implies that we can write our integral as now the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of the natural log of 1 plus tangent of phi, correct? And all of this transforms into the differential element d phi. And I've provided the link to solving this integral in the description using some really cool properties of the definite integral. And the video explaining those properties is also linked. And now for the really cool stuff, starting with the Weierstrass substitution, where we let x equal 1 minus t divided by 1 plus t. Now, this substitution is quite useful when you have terms like x minus 1 or x plus 1 as here, or x squared plus 1, or rational expressions involving these terms. Another motivation behind the substitution is that it maps the interval 0, 1 onto the interval, interval 0, 1. So yeah, the structure of the integral involves provides plenty of motivation to actually employ the Weierstrass substitution. Now, how do the various terms like x plus 1 and x squared plus 1 transform? under the substitution. Well, um, let me just write all of this all of this out so that we have all of the ingredients we need. So x is 1 minus t divided by 1 plus t, and we have a plus 1 here. So this simplifies out to 1 minus t plus 1 plus t divided by 1 plus t. The t's cancel out, and you're left with 2 divided by 1 plus t. And for the uh, x squared plus 1 term, well, you have x squared plus 1 equal to 1 minus t divided by 1 plus t squared plus 1. So that means up in the numerator, you have 1 minus t squared plus 1 plus t squared divided by 1 plus t squared. Now, uh, up here, the cross terms should cancel out. So you're left with 1 plus 1, which is 2, and t squared plus t squared, which is t squared. So I can just factor out a 2 here and write this in a nicer manner. Finally, we have the differential element. Now, how does the differential element transform? Well, obviously, you can use the quotient rule here. So you're left with um, negative 2 dt divided by 1 plus t squared. So that's pretty much it. We have all of the um, 
we have all of the uh, transformations of the terms involved. So this implies that i equals, oh, the limits. Now for x to approach 0, then we see that t will approach 1. And as x approaches 1, we have t approaching 0. So we're now integrating from 1 to 0. And we have a negative 2 here because of the differential element. So negative 2 and the uh, natural log of x plus 1, correct? Which now is 2 divided by 1 plus t divided by 1 plus x squared, which is up here in green. So that's 2 uh, times 1 plus t squared divided by 1 plus t whole squared. And then finally, the differential element. We dealt with the 2, so we're left with dt divided by 1 plus t squared. Now we have lots of nice cancellations going going uh, going around here. So the twos cancel out, these terms cancel out, and you're left with something much friendlier. Now to deal with this negative sign, you could just flip the limits of integration. So you're integrating back from zero to one, and we have the natural log of two. Using the properties of the natural logarithm, we can subtract these terms in their in the form of their logarithm. So we have. Uh, natural log 2 minus natural log 1 plus t. And let me just separate the common denominator that is 1 plus t squared. Now notice that this term here, this term here is the integral from 0 to 1 of the natural log of 1 plus t divided by 1 plus t squared with respect to t. And this term here is just a natural log of 2 uh, integration uh, times an integral from 0 to 1 of dt by 1 plus t squared and there's a minus sign in between. Now this here is just your required integral i. So this implies that if this is negative i and adding an i on both sides, so yeah, cool, you have 2 times i equal to natural log of 2 times this integral, which we know uh, evaluates to the inverse tangent of t with the limits of integration being 0 and 1. So plugging in these limits and dividing by 2 on both sides, we have the natural log of 2. And this is going to sort out to pi by 4, right? Yeah, inverse tangent of 1 is pi by 4 and inverse tangent of 0 is 0. So we have the natural log of 2 times pi divided by 8. So yeah, that was pretty cool. A very aggressive substitution that yielded quite an excellent solution development. Finally, we have Feynman's trick of differentiating under the integral sign. Now I have made a video on this before and that did quite well. However, it's extremely cool, so why not just do it all over again? So we have to define an integral function i of some parameter t. And the simplest choice over here would be to insert the parameter as a coefficient of the x term uh, up there in the uh, argument of the natural logarithm. So we have the natural log of tx plus 1 divided by x squared plus 1 integration with respect to x. And now differentiating with respect to the parameter t, we can now switch up the order of the integration and differentiation operators and we have the integral from 0 to 1 times once you perform the switch up the total derivative becomes a partial derivative with respect to t so we're differentiating partially with respect to t the natural log of t x plus 1 divided by x squared plus 1 and the integration is carried out with respect to x i prime of t now, carrying out the differentiation, we have an integral from 0 to 1 of... Now, we're differentiating partially with respect to t, right? So that means the x terms here are just constants. So we have 1 by x squared plus 1. And differentiating this, we have uh, the reciprocal of t x plus 1. And using the chain rule, we'll have x up here in the numerator because it's the constant in this case. So this is the structure that we now have. So we have the integral of 0 to 1 of x divided by x squared plus 1 times 
t x plus 1 integration with respect to x and this equals the derivative of i with respect to t and now we can perform a partial fraction decomposition a few minutes later there's the partial fraction decomposition that we needed now we're integrating in the x world so the t's are just constants so we can write this as t by 1 plus t squared times the integral from 0 to 1 of dx by 1 plus oh sorry about that by 1 plus tx um, plus uh, 1 by 1 plus t squared times the integral from 0 to 1 of x by x squared plus 1 dx uh, plus t by 1 plus t squared times the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 by 1 plus x squared dx. So yeah, I think I'm going to need a factor. Yeah, I'm going to need a factor of t in here. So on integration, I have 1 by 1 plus t squared times the natural log of, uh, sorry about that, natural log of 1 plus tx with the limits being 0 and 1. Now as x approaches 0, you get the natural log of 1, right, which is 0, so just ignore that. And in the limit as x approaches 1, you have 1 plus t, correct? So yeah, this looks awfully familiar again plus 1 plus t squared times the, uh, I'm going to need a factor of 2 here and a factor of 2 here as well. So twice this times the natural log of uh, x squared plus 1 with the limits again being 0 and 1. Now for the 0 case again you have the natural log of 1 which is 0 and for the 1 case you have the natural log of 2. Okay fine plus t by 1 plus t squared times the inverse tangent. Now the inverse tangent of 1 is pi by 4 and that of 0 is just 0. So this entire structure is the derivative of i with respect to t. And hold up, I missed a negative sign up here. So a negative here and a negative there. Now we're about to take a look back at our integral function i of t because the strategy is to recover back i of t from its derivative. And we're going to do that using integration. And those of you who've seen my videos in the past know that I like to use definite integrals at this stage. So that's pretty much it. We're going to recall our integral function and figure out what limits of integration we should use. So this is tx plus 1 and 1 plus x squared dx. Now if I plug in i of 0, then up here I have the natural log of 1, which is 0. So the entire integral will collapse to 0. And the case I'm interested in is that of having the numerator, numerator being the natural log of x plus 1, which is just the case of i of 1. So i of 1 is the required integral. So we're integrating from 0 to 1 with respect to t. Okay, so on the left hand side that gives me by the fundamental theorem of calculus i of 1 which is just i minus i of 0 which is 0 of course. So just ignore it. And on the right we have the negative, the negative of the integral from 0 to 1 of the natural log of 1 plus t divided by 1 plus t squared with respect to t, which again is the integral i but with a negative sign. So let's just write this as i and transferring it onto the left will give me 2 times i. So 2 times i equals um, the natural log of 2 divided by 2 times the integral from 0 to 1 of dt by 1 plus t squared, correct? Uh, plus pi by 4 times the integral from 0 to 1 of t by 1 plus t squared dt. Now, the first term here on the right hand side evaluates to pi by 4, correct? And the second term, I'm going to need another factor of 2, so that leaves a factor of 8 here. So pi by 8 times the natural log of 1 plus t squared, with the limits being 0 and 1. And as t approaches 0, you get the natural log of 1, which is 0. And as t approaches 1, you get the natural log of 2, right? So, okay, cool. And this is equal to 2 times i. So dividing both sides, dividing both sides by 2 gives me... 
4 times 4 here, and a 16 here, so yeah, this implies that i equals pi times the natural log of 2 by 16 plus pi times the natural log of 2 by 16, which equals pi times the natural log of 2 by 8. So yeah, this was awesome. And although Feynman's trick is my favorite integration technique, I think the Weierstrass substitution takes the win in this case because of the elegance with which we evaluated the integral. So let me know your thoughts on who takes the win in this case, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.